Praise the Lord. Somebody said glory. Yeah. Somebody said hallelujah. God is indeed good, isn't he? And he shows himself uh, merciful and he shows himself uh, to be kind and forgiving and resourceful and a God who protects us and, and lifts us up. And we're so uh, grateful that uh, he has indeed smiled upon us uh, once again. Just a uh, word of prayer as we as we begin tonight's lesson. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your grace, and God, we thank you for your mercy, and we thank you for your undying love, and we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for uh, the Word as he was the Word that became flesh. And God, we thank you for that Word that leads and guides us on, on this day. And God, I pray that uh, your Word will, will move, and it will uh, lift up, and it will restore and it will cause uh, something to start anew. And we, your, your few. Uh, it is in your son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Title of the lesson uh, to, tonight, and we're going to do a little bit with the lesson, and then uh, hopefully we can do a little bit of a video at the end. But the title of the lesson um, tonight is, is uh, Worship Him um, in Truth. And I know that we, we've had a couple of uh, sessions here recently even on as we, we've talked about worship. But I know the scholars who, who, who read worship him in, 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 in truth probably think that he, maybe he left off a word uh, because uh, uh, God's a spirit and we worship him in, in spirit and in truth. But I want to just focus on, on, on the truth tonight. And, 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 and that's a question, uh, or, or generates a question. What is, what is the truth? What, what is the truth? It is God's word. But it isn't, isn't, God rules every portion, every part of our life. But nevertheless, uh, each one of us, whether we admit it or not, maybe if not now, at some point in time, have developed a version of a truth, of some kind of, of truth, of something that we have embraced as being our truth, which may be different from somebody else's truth. But the, 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 but the word is the truth. Uh, it, it's not someone's opinion. It, it's not obligated to be consistent with uh, the culture or it, it's, it's not supposed to make somebody comfortable. It, it is the truth. It, it is the, the standard. It is the standard. And so while we have uh, studied on, on worship, our study in, in Deut Deuteronomy as Moses is preparing the people to move into uh, the land of promise, brings us back really to this worship thing because uh, he is outlining all those things that they need to be uh, prepared for. And so what is, what is, what is worship? What, what is worship? What is worship? Honoring God. Honoring God. Being obedient to God. Honoring God. Being obedient to God. That's right. That's right. That's right. Does worship only occur on Sunday? Every day. Every day. The word says we are to be holy because he, he, he is holy. And, and the word also says that we are to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And so think about that for a moment. Uh, who, who defines what is holy? God does. God defines what is, is holy. And what happens when, when man and not God's word begins to decide what is holy? If, if we're to remember the Sabbath day 
and we are to keep it holy, um, then God's word becomes the guide. But our tendency is we've got to put our own flavor in it and worship becomes something that satisfies us, suits us, um, meets our, our fancy, our, our taste, rather than line it up with, with God's word. And if you can't get Sunday right, what chance do you have of getting a Monday through Saturday correct? If we don't get worship correct, how does that affect our experience in the promised land? We're living in we're living in the promised land, and if God has outlined what worship is, and He's given us directions with respect to worship and honoring Him, and and there are promises that are attached to our appropriate worship, as well as consequences to our disobedience and turning turning away from Him. Wow, we can be in a bad place, and so. Going to the, to, to, to the text, that Moses is giving his last uh, instructions. And his last instructions to, to the people of Israel is, is aimed at, at them uh, developing a heart, of, a heart of love for God. Deuteronomy, the fifth chapter and the tenth verse, it says, And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my Commandments. He shows mercy to those that love him and keep his commandments. Uh, John, the 14th chapter, and the 15th verse, if you love me, keep my commandments. And think about that. Will you uh, worship someone who you don't have strong feelings for? No. No, you, you, you won't. And so it... With obedience goes love, okay? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. You will be o o obedient. And, and Moses wanted the Israelites to mature in faith and love so that they could enter uh, the promised land uh, to mature in, in faith. Think about what had happened to the Israelites, what they had experienced because of doubt and a lack of faith. And they doubted. And because of that, they, they, there's, a, there's a, a, a whole uh, uh, generation of, of Israelites who wouldn't get to see uh, the promised land because of their doubt and, and, and faith. And the word says, without faith, it's impossible to please, to please God. John the 10th chapter and the 10th verse says, The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and destroy. And I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Um, does the enemy have to steal, kill, or destroy what you won't possess? What you won't possess. He doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't have to really, does he? he, did, he you don't have it, you don't have it to take. You won't do what's right to get it. You, you won't do what's right to receive it. It's, it's unfair to, to, to place that on, on him. He doesn't have to, to do anything. Uh, and so when, 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 think about when the people uh, came together to build uh, that tower that would reach into to the heavens, the Tower of Babel, they were disturbed by God, right? He, he, he disturbed their, their communications and their ability to work together. Guess who was watching him and taking note? And Satan was like, you know what? 
That's, that's, that's all I have to, that's all I have to do. Is it, I don't have to take anything away from them. I don't have to fight them. All I got to do is just get in the midst of where they are and cause there be a difference of opinion with respect to the truth. Your truth to say something else and your truth to say something else and before you know it, neither one of you are going in anywhere or will experience the love of God or the promises that he has made to you. If, if the enemy can cause confusion and unbelief in our worship, he's won. He doesn't have to keep us from coming to church. Go on and go to church. Because I know the only thing that's going to happen is you're going to be even more confused and even more stiff neck, even more turn around. And I want, I want you there. The, the rest of them might be okay. But if I can get you to go with your turnaround self, you'll turn around the rest of them. Or, or at least you'll, you'll make so much noise that they won't be able to, to, to go forward. And the question I ask is, is, are you willing to fight for something you don't have enough faith to believe that you're worthy of? That's the thing about the truth. Do you believe what the word says about you? That you are more than, than, a, than, a, than a conqueror. You're more than a conqueror. You've got to have faith to believe that. And are you willing, are you willing to fight for that? Deuteronomy, the 12th chapter, the first verse. Again, that's the text. It says, Moses says, these are the statutes and judgments which ye shall observe to do in the land. The word, the truth. More so than just remember to discuss it and to talk about it, but these are things that you are to observe to make sure that you do in the land which the Lord God of thy fathers give it thee to possess it. You don't have it yet, but you got to possess it. All the days that you live upon on the earth. To worship God means that we honor him, that we bow down before him in reverence with respect, that, that we praise his, his holy name. But it, that, but it also means that, that we serve him. That we, that we work and that we labor for him, doing everything that he has prescribed in order to please him. Just to say, I love him without your works, it, 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 it's, it's, it's short. It, it's coming up short. That might be your truth, but that is not the truth. And so Moses laid out for the people the responsibilities that were required of them uh, to live like God's chosen people and to enjoy God's blessing. And so now we know how to live a lifestyle like we got it going on, don't we? We, we know how to pretend and, 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 and someone will look at us and, and never know that we're, we're, we're struggling. And so he, he, he lays out for them, this is how you gotta, this is how you gotta, gotta live. Is there a connection between obedience and experiencing the love of God? There absolutely is. You, 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 you have no, no right uh, if, if you are not obedient for, for, for those of us who, who uh, are raising or have raised children. How, how important is their obedience? They're, they're either one of the things that's going to happen, if you're going to shower them with love, for obedience, or you're going to shower with them with something else because of their disobedience. Am I right? The 12th uh, chapter in the second verse says, says, 
he, remember now, he's talking about what you got to do in preparation uh, for entering into the promised land and being successful and, and, and benefiting from all that God has, has promised you. He, he says, uh, ye shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which ye shall possess served their gods upon the high mountains and upon the hills and under every green tree. First of all, we, we are to be set apart. And not just to be set apart. Because he says, you know, you, you can separate yourself but not take on any responsibility for what you've separated yourself from. But God's not giving us that, that choice. He says, not only are you to be separate and, there, and live a different kind of lifestyle, but you are to come against, you are to stand against the things that are not like God. That's the requirement. That's a requirement that... that some of us might find un, uncomfortable. We, 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 will, we will say, I'm responsible for my own behavior and my own actions. And they're not bothering me, and I'm not going to bother them. But, but if they're unlike God, then that's not what he requires of us. John, the fourth chapter, the 23rd and 24th verses. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is the spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God is a jealous God. And true worship must reject all false worship. I know that's sort of taking us to, to a different level. Is ignoring or turning our back on something the same as rejecting? Is it the same thing? Are you rejecting it just because you maybe closed your eyes to it? It's... It's, it's, it's not the same. It's close, but it's not the same. I mean, you've heard me uh, say how many times I asked my wife to, to marry me, and, 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 and she said no, but, you know, several times. But I, didn't, I really didn't take that as being rejected, okay? I was, I, it was something else other than utter rejection. See, when you, when you truly reject something, uh, it, there is no, you know, right? It, you reject it. I, well, my little granddaughter, she, she speaks, and if, if she gives you that, that whole sentence that, no, Papa, I don't want it, that's total rejection. Now, now you might get her to taste something, she'll taste it and turn her head away from it, and then I, eh, and, and, and tomorrow you might do the same thing. But if she said, she gives you that sentence, uh, that's total rejection. Uh, the, the attitude that we have sometimes is that it's as long as it doesn't bother me, I'm okay with it. But that's not the same as rejection. It's not the same. Third verse says, and ye shall overthrow their altars and break their pillars and burn their groves with fire. And ye shall hew down the graven images of their gods and destroy the names of them out of that place. We must reject all false worship. Can't compromise. What, is, what does it mean to, to, to compromise? I give in. I take. Uh, you give up something. I give up something. 
we agree to disagree. Uh, you don't make waves. I don't make waves. You stay on your side. I stay on my side. Uh, you sit where you sit. I sit where I sit. Uh, that's not what he requires of us when it comes to worship. He says we, we are to reject all false worship. No compromise. No compromise. There's only one true and living God. The Lord God himself. And he is a jealous God. And his word is true in, in terms of what he requires of us. And so why is it so important to not only reject, not only did he say reject it, but he said, you, you got to destroy it. Anything related to it, you got you to destroy it. So here with John, we have to understand. The way the Canaanites worship, first of all, they had several spots in, in, in the high places, in, 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 in the hills. And they didn't just have one God they worshiped. They worshiped several gods. Um, generally Baal and, and Asherah. And uh, what, what was important to them was fertility. Um, fertility with respect to the, the, the themselves and even to their crops. But they were to destroy, get rid of. Uh, and, and if you, you read some of the history on, on, on the, uh, uh, the, the worshiping of, of Asherah, there, there was something that, some things that were called Asherah poles. Uh, that, you know, they even had prostitutes in, in, in the church who danced on, on the poles. Anybody know what that sort of sounds like? But because they didn't destroy them, still it, it exists today in some, some form or fashion. But Moses pointed out that, that anything idolatrous, that remains in the land, in other words, that, that you don't reject and that you don't destroy, is dangerous because it might become a tool the devil could use in tempting you. Anybody understand what that means, what I'm saying there? Let's suppose you were, you were a smoker. And you remember trying to quit. Could you stand to have or even be around smoking? Can't. It's hot. Drink. You can't keep it around. Because it'll be, it'll be tempting. You can't, you, you, you can't keep it around. If, if there's something that you're trying to, to stop, quit, you need to get, you, you need to get rid of it because the enemy knows how to use that very thing to tempt you. Ephesians, the fourth chapter and the 27 verses, neither give place to the devil. I always say if you, if you give him an inch, he'll take, he take a mile. He'll take, a, he, he gonna, he'll, he'll take the whole thing, right? What the, what the song said, if you, if you let him in your car, he, he want to he wanna, he wanna drive. You, you got you to gotta get rid of him. You got to get rid of him. And so, Whenever we disobey the Lord and and cherish, and, and if you don't disobey, you, you don't uh, get rid of it, destroy it, it's a sign that you 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 cherish it because you're making a a, a choice. Uh, if He wants you to destroy it and you keep it, you're providing an entryway uh, to Satan into your life. If not your life, the generation after you lie. Again, that third verse says, and, and you shall overthrow their altars and break their pillars and burn their groves with fire. And you shall hew down the graven images of their gods and destroy the names of them out of that place. And so when we accept Christ in, 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 into our lives and we accept him as our personal savior and, and we invite him into our into our hearts and in our lives. There are some things that we have to destroy. Is that right? I think each one of us 
uh, has had some experience with, at some point in time, uh, holding on to something that you might have needed to get rid of. And then you figured it out that, no, I just, I just, I just need to, to stop and separate myself. And sometimes, sometimes it's, it's uh, things, sometimes it's people, but what I want to impress upon you uh, tonight is it's, it's attitudes, it's beliefs, it's your truth, uh, your opinions. It, you, it, that's what you need to, to, to get rid of. You, you, you might be holding on to something and, and you say, this is just me. You know, you, you just have to accept me as I am, not, not, uh, not understanding that, that by you continuing to be as you are, that you become that tool that Satan uses to destroy and make worship somewhat ineffective and certainly not what it, what it could be. Because while you are being you with your backward attitude, you can find yourself quenching the spirit, if not your own spirit, the spirit that, 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 that should be residing and occurring in, in the house of, of God. So is there, is there, when it comes to worship, is there room for compromise? He doesn't, he doesn't give us that, that option. And remember, there's a process, there's a way. The Canaanites had, had several uh, temples and, and, and shrines. But what God intended for his people was to have one place, one temple, and that was going to be his dwelling place. That's where he was going to set up his altar, the Holy of Holies. That's where he was going to reside. Deuteronomy, the 12th chapter, the 4th through the 6th verse, it says, Ye shall not do so unto the Lord your God. Nope, you're not going to do that. That's not what God intends for you. But unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there, even until his habitation shall ye seek, and thither thou shalt come, and thither ye shall bring your burnt offerings. He's describing worship. Ye shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and your tithes and heave offerings of your hand and your vows and your free will offerings and the firstlings of your herds and of your flock. He, he's, he, there's no room for compromise. True worship, as we said, is the word of God, right? And he's defining what he expects of them. Now, what is different now? It, it, those elements of worship are still the elements of worship. But, but rather than, than one single place, something has, has, has happened. Uh, starts with John, the first chapter and the 14th verse. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace. And true. Christ came from the heavens, became flesh, walked as a man. A man crucified him. He died, but he rose again and, and ascended to the heaven uh, and, and retrieved his, his cloak of glory and honor, and he sits at the right hand of the Father. The veil was torn, and because the veil was, was torn, rather than now, now then being or now being one temple, we all have become a temple. Now, now each of us who, who trust Christ becomes a temple of God and has the spirit dwelling within them. But it doesn't change our worship. It, it, it doesn't change uh, how we are to treat the temple. Just because the temple resides in you doesn't give you the right or the opportunity 
to, to reshape your temple and make your temple different than my temple. Okay? 1 Corinthians 6, chapter 19 through the 20 verse says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are brought with a price. And so, therefore, glorify who? God in your body, not yourself. And in your spirit, which are God's. You are a temple, but that doesn't make you free to do what you want, when you want it, and how you want it. Then there, we have to acknowledge that, that, that not only are we temples, but the local, every local assembly, assembly is also a temple of God. And we have to know that, that what God is doing, he, he is uh, through our, our sanctification in, in, in the revelation that is to come, that each of our individual temples in every assembly as a temple is going to one day come together and be a part of that universal temple in, in, in the heavenlies. Matthew, the 16th chapter, 18 through 19 verses, and I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in, in heaven. He defines, man, how I'm going to build my church. Yeah, you are uh, a temple, um, but what does he say with respect to uh, the local assembly? Forget not the assembly of yourselves together. Sixth verse in, in, in the text says, And thither ye shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and your tithes and heave offerings of your hand and your vows and your freewill offerings and the firstlings of your herds and of your flocks. Again, the, the, the Canaanites worshiped in several places, but that not that wasn't to be uh, for his people as they were to move into uh, the promised land and receive the promises of God. The, the burnt offerings symbolize total dedication to the Lord. Total dedication. And, 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 and so what does that mean for us if, if we're not burning offerings we're not burning animals anymore. Romans the 12th chapter in the first verse says, since we are the temple, he said, I beseech you therefore, Paul, Paul says, brethren, by the mercies of God, that now you don't present an animal, but you present your bodies. You present you as a living sacrifice. Holy, there's that word, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Well, see, when we have those, those attitudes uh, that we hold on to or that we, we develop, we call ourselves holy, uh, not acceptable unto God, but we call ourselves holy because of what we are comfortable with, what makes us feel good, what, what seemingly the, the culture will accept or what the world will accept. We compromise, we blend. But should we compromise? Should we blend with respect to our worship? The answer is no. There's only one living and true God. That there is only one true worship. There's only one place and one way to approach God. And, and before I, 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 I ask them to show that movie skit, but unity is important. You remember, he's bringing us together to be that one unified body. 
Unity is important. And Satan has learned a lesson that, that if I can just keep them separated, if I can just keep them distracted, if I can cause one to believe that their version of the truth is the truth with respect to worship, if, if, if I can get them to turn away from a common goal or a common objective, if I can get them to, to, to not believe in fellowship, or to walk away from their fellow man, if I can get them to just be satisfied with themselves and not care about anybody else, then I've won. Then I've won. I've thrown a, a monkey wrench into the very plans that, 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 that God has. They, that they, will, they will never walk into your promises. They'll never be all that, 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 that God wants them to be. One, because they've settled already. They, they think they have made it. Well, how, do, how do they say for those who, 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 who exercise no pain, no gain? Some of us don't, don't, want, don't, don't want no pain and don't want to don't wanna, don't wanna learn anything new, don't want to do anything new, don't want to move past or into anything new, that, that this, is, this is good where I am. And, and, and I don't need anybody disturbing, disturbing me. If, 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 a, if a, a, a visitor, a stranger who knew not Christ and walked in, in, in here uh, on, on tonight and, 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 and pretty much in, in some Sundays, I guess, and he looked around, what might be the first thing that that come to their mind. They might say they don't like each other. <laughs> they don't like each other. I've heard of being arm's length, <laughs> but being pew lengths apart. It says something. It communicates something. And and we will say, what difference does it make? We know we know each other. Uh, I'm not upset. They are not upset. I'm comfortable where I am. They're comfortable where they are. But where's the where's the fellowship? Where's the where's the the, the closeness? Sometimes being close makes the world of difference. Being close, close enough sometimes just to ask the question, "How are you?" How are you doing? What's going on with you? What can I pray for? What can I pray for you? Can I pray with you about? Because um, true worship is, is, is more than just about you. Remember, it's, it's us coming uh, together. And so I want to play, play a, a, a clip that... that, that uh, what will cause us to, I think, and cause you to look again what what the definition of a worship is, and 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 maybe question yourselves as to why uh, a definition doesn't roll off your your tongue real quick. Uh, somebody get get the light there as they begin to play, but think about this. If, if you do something all the time and somebody asks what it is that you do, shouldn't you have an answer? If you come to church every Sunday and you worship and somebody asks you what it is you're doing, you ought to have an answer. Ask your attenders of Christian churches all across the country. What is worship? Sadly, most didn't know. And that's part of the reason we created this video series. Understanding worship. Because most people don't. 
Hello and welcome to Understanding Worship. My name is Tom Kreuter and I have had the amazing privilege for nearly 30 years now of ministering in hundreds of Bible-believing churches all across the U.S. and even in other parts of the world and, and, and seeing believers uh, come into a more solid relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ because of the things that I've been able to share. And for the last few years, I've had the privilege of, of actually teaching the things that you're about to go through to thousands of believers all over the place. And the responses that we have gotten have been nothing short of amazing. And so I'm anticipating that God is gonna work in your heart and your life in similar kind of ways through this material. By the time we get done, I am praying that God will have, have done a work in you that will cause you to be more in love with him, that will cause you to be able to express your worship more fully, more completely, and more biblically. Let's dive in. I want us to understand that more than, more than giving an exact definition of worship here today, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna kinda paint a picture. You know, if, if you look at the way that Jesus taught, he very rarely taught line by line. Most of the time, he, he, he told stories, he painted pictures with his words, and that's the kind of thing that, that I'm going to do here. And I also want you to understand right from the beginning here that I am going to intentionally push you a little bit. I'm going to say some things that are designed to make you uncomfortable. See, I am not so much interested in getting you to agree with everything that I say, although I think I'm going to say some things that are pretty worth agreeing with. But my goal is to force you to think about what you believe and why you believe it. You know, if you, if you leave here and you disagree with some of the stuff that I say, I'm perfectly okay with that. I really am. As long as it makes you think about what you believe and why you believe it. You know, if I, if I just come in here and I say a bunch of stuff that we can all nod our heads and say, yes, yes, that's what I always thought anyway, I don't think I've really done my job as a teacher. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push you a little bit intentionally to force you to think about what you believe and why you believe it. All right. Let me, let me start with, with kind of a scenario. Tonight, you're, you're sitting at home doing whatever, and your phone rings, and it's your pastor. And your pastor is at the church building working on a project and would like you to come and help with the project. And so you agree to go. Maybe you agree reluctantly, but you agree. And you get to the church building, and as you walk up to the door, you notice that there's, there's really no lights on. So when you walk in, you flip a switch, and all of a sudden you see a whole bunch of people there, and they all yell, surprise! And it's a party for you, for being such a good person, for all that you do at the church. And, and, they, and, and the people there start singing for he's a jolly good fellow or she's a jolly good lady. That's kind of cool. They're singing to you, but you notice as they're singing that nobody is actually looking at you. They're, they're looking at one another. They're, they're high-fiving one another. They're slapping one another on the back. And then when the, when the song is done, then they kind of, kind of break up and just start milling around and, and talking in groups of people. And you're left standing over on the side all by yourself. And, and so you, you go and you try to get involved in, in various conversations there. But, but each group that you go to, it's like they, they totally ignore you, like you're not even there. And so after a while, you get frustrated. You end up leaving and, you know, think some, maybe somebody will call you and tell you to come back. But but nobody does. All right, that's kind of a far-fetched scenario. But I think that same thing happens to God week after week after week in many churches. We, we gather together ostensibly to worship God, but so often we are, we are fixated on our own ideas and our own preferences. We're thinking more about the I don't know, the, the, the delivery of the sermon or the style of music that's being used or the, 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 other, the other people that are there, anything and everything except for God himself. Let me give you another scenario. Tomorrow morning at your church, there's going to be a, a Sunday school class and it's going to be, let's say, for older teens and for adults. And the person who's going to teach the class is going to spend just a short time, maybe 10 minutes max, talking about worship. What it is and why we do it and how we do it from a biblical perspective. And then just open it up for discussion. Well, tonight you're sitting back at home again after you get back from your party where you, everybody ignored you. 
and your phone rings again and this time it's the person who's supposed to be teaching that class tomorrow morning and fortunately that person wasn't at the party so you're not upset with them okay <laughs> and for whatever reason they can't make it for that class tomorrow morning and they want to know if you will take that class tomorrow morning talk about worship for just a short time and then open it up for discussion honestly how many of you here are ready for that class tomorrow morning let me see your hands see that's that that's uh, seems odd to me you know, three or four people in a group this size. But, and don't misunderstand, it's not odd that, that I've never seen that before. I get, I get the same response every time I ask the question. What I think is odd is that if we do anything on a regular and consistent basis, we can explain it to somebody else. It doesn't matter if it's a, a job or a hobby. If we do it on a regular and consistent basis, we can explain to somebody else, this is what I do. Whether that's, I don't know, flipping hamburgers or laying carpet or playing softball or, or selling car insurance, whatever. If we do it on a regular and consistent basis, we can explain it to somebody else. But we who regularly come to worship God just admitted that we can't explain it to somebody else. I think that's odd. And, and please understand that here today, if I can say it like this and not have you get haughty about it, we have the cream of the crop. You guys are the, the movers and the shakers. You're, you're not content just to kind of sit on the side and observe. You want to be involved in what's going on. So if we can't explain it, we can't expect somebody else to be able to explain it. You know, when, when, I, when I began leading worship more than 40 years ago, when I began teaching about worship more than 35 years ago, there was not a lot of information that was available. Oh, there were a few books, but very few. Today, <laughs> there is a plethora of information. There are books and magazines and, and seminars and conferences and online materials and just on and on and on. There's this gigantic amount of information, but I liken that gigantic amount of information to a very, very large smorgasbord. And on that smorgasbord, there are some things that are really good and healthy and nutritious. But there are also some things that are perhaps tasty, but don't have a lot of nutritional value. And there are also some things on that smorgasbord that are downright toxic. And I think we need to be very cautious about what we ingest, if you will. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, it says, let us offer to God acceptable worship. Let us offer to God acceptable worship. That verse at least implies that there is worship that is not acceptable. Anybody want your worship in that category? I know I don't. And so what I'm going to do here today is we're going to look at several different ideas, not so much definitions as ideas that I've heard about worship over the years. And I'm going to read each one of them. And after I read each one, then we're going to, we're going to examine it. We're going to explore it. We're going to unpack it. But mostly we're going to hold it up to the light of scripture to see if it really is biblical. Now, before I get into those specific ideas, I, I, I feel like I need to lay a little bit of a foundation here to kind of, kind of give us some undergirding. So, so give me a, a couple of minutes here to kind of, kind of start us off, if you will. When, when I was in seminary, what at this point in my life seems like several thousand years ago, one of our professors one day gave us an assignment. And the assignment, very simply, was to do a word study on that word worship, to look up in our English Bibles all of the times that the word worship is used, and then to look at the original languages, the, the Hebrew from the Old Testament, the Greek from the New Testament, and see what the words that we translate as worship literally mean, and see what the context tells us about it, and then to come to some overall conclusion about this thing called worship. Well, if you do that, and you do it honestly, you'll come to at least three very clear, very obvious understandings of worship. Worship honors God, it's directed toward God, and it requires involvement on the part of the worshiper. Now, my, my video curriculum, Worship Our Highest Calling, I kind of go into that concept with, in some depth. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this right now. But I do want to at least flesh that out a little bit for you. I am not opposed to using terms like worship leader. But when I tell people that I'm a worship leader it can give them the impression that that means that I can get folks to worship. 
And that's simply not true. Oh, well, I can offer the opportunity, but it's like the old adage, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Every one of us needs to, by God's grace, make the choice to involve ourselves in directly honoring God through our worship. Worship honors God, it's directed toward God, and it requires involvement on the part of the worshiper. Now, let me, let me add one more piece before we get into the, 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 the ideas that I talked about earlier. And this one I want to put in here because I think this is so essential that we really grasp this idea. No matter how sincere our worship, no matter how pure our hearts on our own, we can never measure up to God's standards. We're always going to fall short. 1 Peter 2.5, it says this, You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. A holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices? That sounds like worship to me. That's exactly right. But it says that the spiritual sacrifices are acceptable how? Through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ. It's only because what Jesus did on the cross that even our praises are made acceptable to God. Mike Cosper is the pastor of worship and arts at the uh, Sojourn Community Church in Louisville, Kentucky. And he wrote this. Our best efforts to worship in spirit and truth, feeble or as confused as we may be, ascend to the heavens through faith in Jesus. They're cleansed by his blood and they arrive at God's throne, a perfect, pure, and fragrant offering. I love that. See, he's saying exactly what Peter just said in the passage that we just read. It's only because of what Jesus did that even our praises are made acceptable to God. Otherwise, all we've got is a bunch of filthy rags, honestly. I mean, think about it. And I believe this needs to be a, a settled issue in our hearts. And here's why I'm saying that. Because if you're like most people who come to these seminars, at some point during the course of this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share one of these statements and on the inside you're going to go, oh, I fall way short in that one. And the truth is that if you say that or think that, you're probably right, you do. But here's the deal. So do I. And that's why Jesus came. To redeem us. To make us acceptable to the Father. We can't do it on our own. We don't have it. But because of what Jesus did, we are acceptable in his sight. Wow, I hope you're already feeling a little bit challenged in, in the things that were shared. But I want to take it a little bit further because I want to challenge you a bit more. You can, you can just watch these videos get all done with each one and just kind of go about your business. But what's going to help you the most, what's going to make the most difference is for you to take time to go through and answer the questions, the going deeper questions in the participants guide at the end of each section. You, if you just watch it, you might learn. Uh, you're, you're a member of a football team and, uh, you might be a running back, you might be a wide receiver, you may be on the offensive line or the defensive line, defensive um, you know, defensive backfield or in the quarterback. And through the week, your segment of the team practices together. You go through your individual and, and separate drills together in preparation for the game. And But what if what if you never came together as a team, whether it be on offense or defense, but you never came together, you never discuss what the overall game plan for the game was, what do you think is going to happen on the day of the game? It ain't, it ain't gonna, it ain't gonna be, ain't gonna be pretty. Uh, uh, and I, and I think we, we easily have the tendency of doing that in the church with respect to true worship. Uh, our auxiliaries, our, our, our functions, and whatever our ministry is, and whatever it is that, that we do, it, it is easy to get off task and get off target with what the ultimate goal is, even to the point of sometimes be, uh, creating a sense of, of competition um, between 
each other. That's not true worship. It, it doesn't lend itself to what, what the things that God has, has prepared for us. Sometimes we treat all those things that, that, that relate and make up worship as is if it's a buffet. And we can decide which things we like and which things we don't like and which things we will be a part of and which things we won't touch or won't be a part of. But again, that's us establishing our own version uh, of the truth and establishing an attitude uh, that's not uh, congruent, that it doesn't build, but in its own way it separates and it divides. And so I, as, as we continue to talk about real, real worship, um, you challenge yourself to think of, about your own definition. You question yourself, have you established a set of truths and an a attitude and, and, and you believe that, that where you are is, is right? And even if, 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 if you're not to the point of saying whether it's right or wrong, you're at least saying you're happy with where you are and they're happy with where they are and as long as everybody's happy, we all good. But that's, and what happens is, is that when you settle, then you tie the hands of God because you're not pulling upon his anointing. Uh, you're not relying on your, your faith um, to move you to a level that, that he expects and has prepared for you. Um, you're coming short because you've decided to be short. And that's not true worship. Amen? All right. Any any comments? Any questions? Yes, sir. There's no limit in the Lord to when you can, you know, when you leave for this life, the life to come, you still be learning and you go to him. We all want to be submissive to God and stay up under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He he purchased our life with his blood when he went to Calvary. So we not no more our own. It was in the word when we was talking tonight when you was teaching. You know, it's, if we gonna serve God, we gotta deny ourselves. We gotta let God use us as he see fit, as he see fit. It's not we I wanna do or anybody else wanted to do. You know, we wanna do to please him, not ourselves. We got to deny ourselves, Lord, what you want for my life? What you want, how you want me to do this? I want to do it to please you, not to please myself. Because myself, I want to get myself out of the way. I want to get to just whatever you have for my life, Lord. I want to get, you can get glory out of my life. See, that's the way I look at it, like things that sin I've done, and you know you didn't repent over it, you make that 180 degree turn, that you were saying, Lord, I did something that I know wasn't pleasing to you or wasn't in your will, but I know what I want to ask you for forgiveness, and Lord, I want you to keep me up under your blood vow. You know, keeping the faith. See, just like what you were saying, Satan wanted to keep, he was the most beautiful angel in heaven. He was trying to get our faith and keep us confused when we can't serve God in our mind and our faith. If we don't keep coming be on one accord and get one you. And, and you know, one unit. See, God wants to come together and be as one. And then we can hear from God because as long as we stay separated, and that's what Satan wants. See, we need to come in. If you was a Christian living for the Lord, some kind of way your spirit should have intercede with my spirit, my spirit should have intercede with your spirit. So, some kind of way we should be able to connect and we should agree. You know, it's not what I say and you say, it's what God says, what His words say. We need to live. And we may not come up to the standard where he want us to live, but we want to live where we can try to at least try to please him. And say, Lord, if, if yesterday, today I want to do better than what I did yesterday. Each day I want to draw close. Because if we, our, 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 our soul salvation is when we were born, we coming closer each day to our, you know, our grave where we got to stand before God one day and give an account of what we've done, good or bad. 
but he can say good, faithful servant. He gonna do the separation and go be from the chair one day. So we need to try to stay right with God, no matter what we did in the past. You can't go back to that person and ask them for forgiveness. They made a past, or, you know, left them this life, the life to come, or moved out of state or whatever. Lord, I want to get right with you. You know, we can't be an Enos or Elijah, uh, Max Cancer, that you know, one that never did see death. The only thing we can do is just try to say, Lord, I want from this moment on to try to live according to your word to please you. You know, and I just ask the church and and everyone just pray my strength in the Lord. You know, when we all come to be, you know, to be in the body of Christ, we all. It's like a whole body. We want to fit in. We, we got a part we should fit in. in. And well, we know that one day that it's going to be all over with down here. And it's, we just live in temporary now. But once we get to heaven, that's when we really going to sing. We really going to enjoy. It's, it's, it's an it's a individual challenge. When we accept him in, into our life, it is he that makes us new creatures however sometimes we seem to feel like it's we making ourselves something and the something we have the tendency to want to make ourselves is is that something or that somebody that's that's that we're comfortable with and, and who we believe uh, and what we believe and and so I again I implore you um, to, to, to just challenge your, your own your own attitudes and, and your own beliefs um, that you now are being led by. Could there be something else different? Could there be something else more? And then I want to say this, and then we'll have prayer and leave. I want those of you who are here uh, on tonight to just know that uh, how much I appreciate uh, your sacrifice and and uh, you being uh, out. Um, I don't I don't take it lightly. All right, let's stand and, and be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we just thank you again for your grace, and God, we thank you for your mercy. God, we thank you for um, this day, and we thank you for um, your word. We thank you for these, um, your, your saints who have gathered here on to today, tonight, and, and even those that have, have uh, tuned in through uh, social media. God, I, I pray that, that, that your word, uh, not my word, has, has resonated um, with your people, that, that it has caused there to be a, a, a question um, that on the inside uh, that, that causes there to be an action um, to explore uh, their own personal behaviors and, and accepted standards with respect to worship. To honoring you, to obeying you, to showing their the love for you, for not only agreeing with your word, but also being doers of your word. God, there is a, a, a work, your word lets us know that there is a work that's already pre-ordained and set aside um, for your people, for each one of us. I, I, I pray, oh God, that 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 there becomes a, a a deeper understanding and an open arm willingness uh, to be led by the Holy Spirit, to be moved by the Holy Spirit, to follow that that light that that shines upon our pathway to incline our ears to that push, that, that shove, that, that moves us in a direction that you would have us to go. Not just as individuals, but as a church body. Uh, we are all members um, while being separate, but we're all members of, of the same body. And, and, and I pray, oh God, that, that, uh, that, that, that your word will, will cause there to be a, a fire down on on the inside uh, that 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 causes there to be um, a rise in in action, a rise in in service, a, a, a rise in in the willingness to to not only serve but to to be there for uh, the fellow brothers and and sisters 
in Christ. God, you've not only prepared a way or, or seat, uh, there's not only a, a purpose for each of us as individuals, but there's also something you've outlined for this particular body of Christ as you have for every body of Christ. And so God, I pray on, on tonight that for this body of Christ, uh, that your word and your, your mission um, to engage, to energize, to equip, um, to be equipped comes clear. Uh, that is not about our business, but it's about our Father's business. And that there needs to be a learning, and not only there needs to be a learning, but there needs to be a yearning, and there needs to be a burning, and that there needs to be an understanding that we're not only to be disciples, but we also to be those that uh, engage and teach others to be disciples, that we'll be in line with, with your mission that all men um, be saved and God that starts with with each and every one of us God I thank you oh God for your, for your son Jesus Christ and in his life and, and he becoming sin for our sakes the blood that that he shed that that thank you oh God for adopting us in, into your family that we now are, are here heirs uh, to what you have established for us and there's a seat in the heavenlies right now awaiting on us. And so, God, as we, we continue to, to live and move toward that direction, God, uh, I pray that you would continue to bless, that you would continue to strengthen, that you continue to, to heal and, and to protect. And, God, as we leave this place, God, I just thank you uh, for these, your people, and that you would lead them and that you would guide them and you would take them uh, home safely and that they would find home better than even when they left it, God. Not just the material part of home, but that spiritual part of home, that there'll be an a air of peace, an air of sweet release in you and your son, Jesus Christ. God, we'll be careful to give you the honor and the glory. It's in your son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.